Hello, 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 and welcome to the Loudcast with me, your host, Kevin McLean. I am still here in my flat in Leith, still bringing you the very best of spoken word. And this show, I am very excited for because we have an incredible special guest in the form of Hannah Lavery, who is a tremendous playwright and poet and just all round good chap. So we're going to be chatting to her about all the projects she's working on, uh, her amazing theatre piece, The Drift. It's going to be so much fun. We're also going to be chatting to her about our weekly release video from Jim Monaghan this week. It is called That Summer and I'm really excited to chat to Hannah about Jim. She's known him a very long time. It should be a a uh, bit of a giggle. Um, but we are also going to be looking at two other videos to kick things off. And the first one is from Maddie Haynes. Uh, she was a poet kind of kicking around in the scene, maybe, what was it, 2016, 2017 in Edinburgh. And uh, she won a bunch of slams and then kind of disappeared into the ether and by that I think I mean she moved down south and um, but she was around for a little bit and we got a video of one of her amazing poems which is uh, letters to the pig whose heart valve was transplanted for my uncle uh, so enjoy to whom it may concern it feels weird to be writing so formally after the 10 Christmases we've spent and the birthday presents you've sent me but it felt like poetry was the only language that we might both speak so I could say thank you in both human and pig. I'm just sorry that it took me this long. My family aren't big talkers. We have a tendency to keep our hearts to ourselves until they get so full that they collapse and we need new ones. And I'm sorry that we took yours without asking. Dear pig, I read somewhere that it's not uncommon for sows to eat their own young on pig farms. And maybe that's the only way they know to keep them safe. To take them back inside and hope that next time might be better. And while I'd never eat you, I'd tear you apart myself to stop my mother from crying. I don't know what they did with the rest of you. If you're now a series of miracle pig uncles, a whole race of sphinx-like pig woman angels, I hope so. And while it would be naive to say you were born again, your body turned into 10 more years of family. And I think I'd like to die like that. Dear pig, sometimes there's a hole in my chest too. Do you think we feel the same? Dear pig, if you'd sat by my uncle on a quiet afternoon, You'd have heard the soft whirring of his mechano insides, that farmyard sci-fi tick, tick, tick. Mum joked he was a cyborg, but he was evolution. One step closer to 100% you, 100% prime, lean, peacefulness. And while it was a sound that I know you never got to hear, my uncle sounded like you, pig. And I wanted you to know that. When my uncle's porcine song stopped ticking, my cousins made his ashes into jewelry and they wore them so that he could be everywhere they were, pig and man, inseparable now, indistinguishable. And so loved. That was Maddie Haynes there with a tremendous piece, tremendous performance. Uh, yeah, it was great having Maddie in the scene. Hopefully she's away studying somewhere and comes back soon. That would be lovely. Uh, but for now, we're going to rock on to a guy who never goes away, who has never left the scene. He is a stalwart. He is an LPOG. He is Callum O'Dwyer. And this is his tremendous poem, Bones. Bones. When my brother has an epileptic seizure... He goes down hard. Almost every time so far, he has fractured bones, gratuitous bruising, even a bit tongue. Like a bird failed by frozen wings, his limbs give way under gravity's buckle, his limbs become elastic bands and dead weights, his limbs become crumple zones. And as hard ground hits hard, he hits the hard ground hard, broken collarbone, shoulder. I remember the night of the first seizure, my mum calling her nurse's voice, cracking under the strain of her mother's fear. He's had a seizure, Callum, 
And I thought back to when I was young and he was younger. We sat in the back of the car. His eyes started rolling in his head. His head looked like a skull. His jaw chattered like wound up joke teeth and how that had made me laugh. I thought back to the science classroom where we learned that electrons will always take the path of least resistance. Short circuit, when wires cross, the light bulb goes out. When wires cross, the light bulb goes out. And I thought back to when I was 10 and he was seven. We're running, I tripped and fell on top of him and it should be stressed that I was by no means a slim child breaking the collarbone he's been breaking ever since. And I remember hearing that it's impossible to lick your own elbow. But then seeing my brother through a miracle of double jointedness and tongue length doing just exactly that. And I thought back to school where the boys would make him do it over and over and over and over and called him weird. He kept going to school, but now, above all, brother, I think of your sense of humor. The following a class where I had to watch knee surgery, exacting, boring, extracting marrow, the sight of breaking bones had me running from the room and vomiting all the way up the toilet wall. You sent me knee surgery videos to elicit the same reaction for a week. Or how you once laughed so hard you put a hole through your tongue, or how you giggle yourself to sleep at night just because you think of something funny. And now you study physics because you have electricity in your brain which might short circuit but has left you beautifully brilliant. And you know the Newtonian cruelty that actions have reactions. As hard as you hit hard ground, hard ground hits back just as hard. And finally I think of birds with hollow, fragile bones who can fly fast and light. And a boy who has taught me the meaning of strength is healing your bones and taking flight. You can fly forever. You can do the impossible. You can even lick your own elbow knowing you might fall. But if you laugh all the while, laugh hard and laugh long, you'll be strong down to your bones. You're my brother, and I'll pick you up when you fall. Callum O'Dwyer there, and that has long been one of my favourite pieces of his. Uh, he writes with such delicacy and emotion, and it comes from such a, a genuine and heartfelt place. It's, yeah, it's hard not to empathise with Callum when he's on stage. I love Callum O'Dwyer. He is tremendous. Uh, but we move right on uh, to our new release poem of the week which we're going to be chatting to Hannah Lavery about with uh, and it is from again one of my very favorites in the scene Jim Monaghan he is uh, what could you say about Jim he is a stalwart he is a tremendous writer an incredible performer and a, a huge mentor to so many people that come into the scene he is someone that stays engaged with the grassroots of the spoken word scene and, and helps to, to nurture that and bring people on and a lot of people have learned a lot from Jim Monaghan so I hope you enjoy this piece that summer. It didn't rain for weeks, not a drop. We all met up, all of us, every night, kicked about the park or the shop, and we went, when we went home, it was still light. At weekends, and the whole summer, we'd go up the glen, build fires, smoke, and drink and dance. Then that boy drowned swimming in the quarry. We were fearless then, we took a chance. Someone else's dad had lost her job and I watched her dance on her own to Black Uhuru. They say the hosiery is next to close and she wore a headscarf of shocking orange and blue sky blue. Some guy brought an oxo and said it was harsh. And someone was saying what they were saying. We talked about going in a minibus to see the clash. Shouldn't be surprised, they said. She'd always been a trouble brain. After that, we camped out together more often for a while. This place is dying. There's nothing here anymore. That summer, the nights got darker. And then we were off to uni or London or the wall. And I see the Glen sometimes from the train And sometimes she's there And in her hair, a scarf of shocking orange and blue sky blue She'd always been a troubled way And she's dancing on her own to Black Uhuru Those were the days, my friend We thought they'd never end We'd sing and dance forever and a day Live the life we choose We'd fight and never lose For we were young and 
sure to have our way. Thank you. That was Jim Monaghan with That Summer. Uh, oh, amazing piece from an amazing performer. And it was nice to see him accompanied by Sam Thorne, our resident pianist. Uh, Jack Hinks was off back in January and we were thrilled to have Sam back in for a show. It had been a little while and yeah, they worked together perfectly for an amazing piece. And we're going to talk about that piece and so much more with our guest today. I'm so excited to have her. She's one of my faves and just an all-round good card. Please give it up and welcome to the show, Hannah Lavery. I say give it up. I say give it up like people are clapping at home. I just want to be back on a stage, Hannah. This makes me sad. How are you doing? I'm all right. Yeah, how are you? Oh, good, good. Staying sane, getting furrier and furrier um, as time goes on. How are you surviving lockdown? Um, Much better since the kids went back to school, I have to say. Um, It's all right, really. I don't really see a massive change to my life in some ways. It's just... um, drinking tea yeah. and reading books and doing the zoom calls that's been you doing lots and lots of zoom calls and that is the life of a poet now zoom panel discussions and all that sort of stuff which is um i'm quite it still boggles it. my I mind I'd anywhere, never, yeah. so that's quite nice i'd never heard of zoom before <laughs> march yes. or whatever it was this year no, I so, can't imagine there was a time when i didn't know about it it's like when you've had a baby and you think i can't remember when you weren't here I sort of feel like that about Zoom. Like, (laughs) surely we've always known about this. Um, it makes everything so much easier. I I saw a great uh, meme, though, which was just someone had um, tweeted at Skype, being like, you had a 12-year head start and Zoom still is managed to become the thing. Like, how was Skype not the one that took over conference calling, right? Very strange. Yeah. Okay, I don't know the answer to that. But yeah, that's it's because it's got such a good name, Zoom. Zoom. Actually, I've got a poem <laughs> recently actually called Zoom Love, where I've just got lots of um, long pauses. Like, <laughs> the, the thing I wanted That's to say was... Uh, <laughs> it's honestly, it's the best thing about this loudcast is just I get to hear a different voice every now and again. This mm. is... The, the, I've not really done Zoom. I don't know why. I, I like... I haven't I haven't swung into it. I've done a couple Zoom meetings when I really had to, but I, I don't know the whole. I think it's just because I miss the real world too much. I'm like I don't want to get into Zoom and take on this new practice. I want things to go back to normal. Well, it's quite. I had the best thing of the week was I had this really really. I shouldn't say this. I won't say what it's about. I had a very long conferency thing that I'd been. Um, wanted to see it wasn't to do with work just in case work's listening um it was another thing (laughs) (laughs) and um i realized i could turn my screen off and my mic off because i wasn't like required to make any response it was like a lecture Mm -hmm. and then i could just have a sleep (laughs) so i just (laughs) lay on the sofa just like snoozing and every so often i would just sort of like lean over and like press like a like or something so it knew that was kind of and I thought it was the best it was the best way to learn anything it was really nice <laughs> just, got... just <laughs> napping combining na- napping with zooming is a good yeah, system it was sort of, well, I, I think I appreciated it more like I learned more than I would if I'd been like in a really uncomfortable seat in a wee hall drinking there is an like, argument Luke, to Luke, that look look room look warm coffee <laughs> uh, um I did enjoy the sort of yeah, I don't mind it. I don't mind kind of like, I did a um, Sonnet Youth when I was just at home and it was quite nice just kind of, you know, one one minute you're having your tea and then you go into your, your by your desk and you do a couple of wee poems and, and then you're done. Um, See, I didn't, I, I really freaked out. I did a quarantine cabaret and like I finished and just sort of turned my camera off and was like, Nope, this is too. I need the decompression time. I need a pint and a chit chat and the bus home and all of that yeah. before I, I'm relaxed. I couldn't just go back to for like the high energy performing to sitting back on my couch just like well that was a 10 second commute good fun yeah or maybe my performing is not high energy enough that I just like oh, that's lovely <laughs> <laughs> I can have a glass of wine and we can go and watch telly um yeah that's no, it I'm amping I've, myself uh, up too much you know, maybe my performing is slightly different than when I'm on Zoom maybe I'm a bit more kind of and here's a poem that I'm sure you'll all want to hear. 
<laughs> Speaking of high energy performance, oh, Jim oh. Monahan. <laughs> there's there's Jim. the worst segue ever. <laughs> I used to, I used to always introduce Jim as the shining light of the spoken word, Scottish spoken word scene. And just to be like, I would always amp him up as this joyous, happy figure to bring him onto the stage to then bum everyone out with his sad birthday poem. It was good Aww. times. Uh, what well, did you think a, of Jim's poem? There's a beauty to his melancholy, I have to say. There I really think. is. And that poem, that birthday poem breaks my heart. The, the birthday one when he mm. does the and I had 127 Facebook likes and you're like oh dude uh, but yeah that summer what a beautiful piece right yeah really is mm. I was um, I was going to tell a story but when he did this he did that poem um, at a little night that we ran as part of Coast Word at, um, a little pub in Dunbar called the Station Yard which is like literally um, the old kind of station waiting room I think and it sits about 20 people. And it's when I say sits 20 people, it means people are like sitting on each other's laps and on the floor and <laughs> um, standing up at the door and everything. Um, and Jim did that poem. And at the end, the entire room started to sing along. And it was just oh, the wow. most gorgeous, gorgeous moment. And I think um, he does have that ability just to, I don't know, what is it? Like just to sort of have you know just evoke a real complete feeling i think just a real complete moment it's It's funny because because jim's stuff i often think is very stripped back and like you know he doesn't go into a lot of you know intense imagery or you know like very descriptive but what he does is the bits he does describe of a of a scene or a narrative or a person or a location are always like these real touchstones that put you right into a thing like i i that's a line that'll live in my head forever uh in from his poem uh united colors of cumnick where he goes where men who suffer heart attacks go walks with three-legged dugs and it's just that image of like a guy with a three-legged dog and the, the sort of like I don't know why it just conjures something so think, specific yeah, in yeah, my head I've always thought Jim's I mean, I've always described Jim's poem as, poems as full of imagery um, but I know what you mean I suppose it's not they're not images that are like packed up stacked up together there's there's space yeah. for them which, they're not um, over described it's not like that really flowery imagery right where it's it's like no. trying to conjure this 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 totally surreal or, or very overpowered sort of idea to your head, right? A lot of the vocabulary I see used in poetry is not everyday vocabulary and it, it, it deliberately conjures something n- n- not everyday in your head, right? Whereas Jim uses a lot of that real, um, yeah, like the way people really talk and really sound to to under underline all of his stuff, I think. I'm not describing it very well, but he does. <laughs> yeah, I think it's... Um... <laughs> Well, he writes from where he's at, where he is, and what he knows yeah. um, through the eyes of a poet. Like he's observing his world, and he is he is documenting it, and he is speaking of something real. Um, yeah. And and that is I think what even... I think you respond to is the should we say the authentic voice? Not that oh, everything that Jim writes is oh, true. Like voice. I also know that sometimes he just puts. You know, like it's not um, a diary. There are bits that he's um, borrowed totally. from here and there and made up and made, as all poets do. Like we, we use fiction to tell the truth, don't we? Um, totally. There is something. Um, I mean, there's also so, always something political there, whether that's you know small p yeah. politics. Yeah. Because, I don't know. Do we say small p politics? Is that <laughs> we but do now, else? Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> Small C conservative, isn't it? That's where I'm getting them from. <laughs> small small, small P, P politics. politics. I like it. Small P politics. <laughs> uh, that's, P. I've never, I've never written a capital P politics poem, but I've done, I've done a lot of small I've P, P small politics. You know, P's. just little pisses <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But I, I think I think one of the things Jim does so well as as well is like when we're talking about like authentic voice, right? In terms of what he's talking about, subject matter and stuff like that. But I think something Jim does, and I know because he hates it, is that sort of poetry voice, right? The the a lot of poets are very sing songy and stuff, and it suits some people. It, it works really well. But like Jim does a very interesting thing where there's there's a real rhyming structure to that poem, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to put your finger on it from the way Jim performs it. Because he doesn't emphasize the the sort of rhyming words or anything like that, he he delivers it almost monologue-y, If you know what I mean, mm. 
I which, think which does, I, th- I think is there to service the poet, the poem, not mm-hmm, the poet. Mm-hmm. There are some. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, there's some there's some performances you see that you think you're presenting yourself. You're not necessarily yeah. presenting your. You're not doing the service to the poem. Whereas I think Jim yeah. performs the poem. He doesn't perform Jim. That's a really nice way to put it. Actually, I mean, yeah. that's that's I an interesting that's way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that wise. <laughs> because you do get that right because when like, that, that, that makes a lot of sense actually because when you think about you know those very you know maybe something very linguistically challenging it's fast paced there's lots of rhyming structure and stuff and you're really underpinning it that's you're not thinking about the story or what you, the emotion you're trying to convey you're trying to convey the flashiness of your words right whereas yeah um, if you're performing for the way the poem should be or or what it's trying to convey or the, or the moment, or whatever the moment. I don't know. If, yeah, like I suppose poems are different. You know, I don't know. This is a, 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 almost an impossible conversation in the sense that yeah, there's, yeah. No, there's no right answer to it. You know, like poems are what they are and people who appreciate them are what they are and what they appreciate about them. I just, I hate, I think what I hate and hate and hate about some some stuff around the poetry culture is that kind of this is what a good poem is this isn't a good poem this is what's quality this isn't and i sort of i've always been a bit like what is the app you know like where, what appetite what's the appetite what's the hunger what is the what do people want and oh no that's that's not what i mean either because there is a quality there has to be a sort of art to it but i just think it's not but I, I, yeah, it's hard I to put, like, mean. like I just a good example. When people say yeah. this is the way it should be because I don't think yeah. this or this is the best way to do it or this is the best example of because I think I think that's really dangerous. I, I think, think especially with something as flexible and malleable as poetry, right? Where obviously yeah. there is there is form and there is structure and there are things you can learn and techniques and styles and you know I mean you can you can learn the nuts and bolts of of any art form but like any art form the the real masters of it find their playroom in in the interpretive sections between the rules right like that's where innovation comes in people that push the boundaries of accepted rules or or structures and, and things like that so I'm like there is there's always there's always got to be a come and go between what the the structures of a thing are to make it yep that is a poem because it's a villanelle and I can show you it's a villanelle and da 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 and well that's a poem because it has this type of language and it, 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 it's because of what it's not you know it's not a monologue or not a, a song or whatever like I, I think there is room for the grey area stuff uh, I know I know people have pointed the fingers at you know me personally like me and Doug Gary have a, a po- what well, we call it a poem called Big Love which is essentially a two person five minute rant about why women should date fat guys right but like I still Friends. think it's <laughs> yeah, exactly right <laughs> I still think it's a poem, but a lot of people and like a lot of like, you know, well praised, sophisticated poets have went, that's not a poem to us quite hostily. And you're like, uh, yeah, I mean, there's been, there's, I, I feel like it rhymes be, at bits. Yeah, I feel that history has shown you that if you want to be one of the people in the world that says that is not what that person says, you know, like if you want to be that in that camp, if that's where you want to stick your flag and this is what it is and this is what it isn't. Then you know history shows you that you're you. It's those are the you know those are the those yeah. are the ones that are not they're they're bad people. <laughs> you're um, not going to come off the best at the <laughs> end of it. I just and I also think there's something as well about you know if you want diversity in all of it and all of that culture like where does poetry come from like where are we yeah. saying that poetry has to come out of this tradition and if we are saying it comes out of that tradition, what are we robbing ourselves of? What voices are we silencing in saying this is the tradition and this is the way it should be and this is the way poetry is and this is what's good and this is what we 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 cut people out of that's a real way of yeah that's a way of thinning the herd I think um, it's the thing I yeah the thing I always point out is the Beatles didn't know how to read or write sheet music but they're one of the greatest bands of all time you know what I mean like you can. 
there are people who who know how to make something sound good without necessarily understanding all the mechanics of a thing and sure that might not make their poem technically correct if it was you know measured against this specific criteria but it doesn't make it a bad thing if people like hearing it or reading it right like that's the yeah. and what you got to take and also that this maybe you know like and also that things have been dismissed because people don't understand them or or mm-hmm. they don't fit what their idea of quality is because they are they are seeing it from a particular gaze whether that's a male gaze where that's a a, a western gaze um or you know a gaze whatever gaze of privilege that you have you know yeah you can if you're you're if you're not questioning what you think why you think that is good and that's bad and what you know like there has to be a little rigorous sort of um self reflection there do you know what i mean yeah no I think I, absolutely that, yeah I think that we and and yet that isn't and and if you don't like something I mean there are definitely you know if someone comes on stage and reads like a Guardian article with line breaks (laughs) (laughs) yeah I mean I don't like that personally totally but but other people but you wouldn't you wouldn't wouldn't go up to their face and be like not a poem like no just don't like it just sit quietly and don't like it (laughs) Usually in those moments, everyone else is standing up cheering, going, yes, that's it, and clicking their fingers, whatever they do. And I'm just going, I read that in a blog. Like, that's not... <laughs> but that's but that's because that's what I like. And, that's, and yeah, actually, yeah. that whole room was moved by whatever information or whatever opinion was found. At... So, you know, who am I to to say? And, and actually, what what is... What does that do to stand up and say, I am the gatekeeper, I am the... It's not yeah. a really nice place to be as a human being, is it? <laughs> not particularly, not particularly. Um, you mentioned, weirdly, it's part in my head, just because we're talking about fin- uh, Jim Monaghan, and then you brought up finger snapping there. One of my favourite encounters ever with Jim was we were at, at Glasgow, uh, it was the Scottish Nationals, it was at the Oran Moor in Glasgow, and uh, there was a bunch of Edinburgh people there, like student Edinburgh folk. Oh, a bunch of and Edinburgh they're like, people, it's the worst that insults it and gives someone... <laughs> We are, we're terrible. Uh, and but like, because there was a real like student vibe around the poetry scene in Edinburgh at the time, and it was it had a real like North American vibe because there was a lot of Americans in it, and they're sitting clicking away, clicking away, clicking away. And I went out for a cigarette at the half, and I was the first person at the smoking area. And Jim Monahan, who was competing, came storming out into the <laughs> into the smoking area and went, "Who's eating fucking crisps?" And I was just like. <laughs> I don't, he thought someone was rustling the, like crisp packets. I was like, I think they're clicking because they like it, Jim. And he went, Arr! so much rage in his face. It was amazing. <laughs> well, it the is joys. A, it's a weird, yeah. I think the first time, do you know, it reminded me of when I was at university, I had this really lovely, lovely friend who was in the Christian Union. And she said to me, would you like to come to church with me on Sunday? And I, because I'm a nice person, went, well, why don't I give it a wee shot and see what this means something to her? So we went to this sort of, I don't know if it was a Baptist church or, anyway, this was, I mean, I haven't, my whole experience of, of church is like Catholic chapel. So I wasn't, you know, <laughs> but here I go into this church and I'm sitting beside my really good friend and she collapses halfway through. She sort of just oh, no. falls to her seat. And then in front of me, someone else falls to their seat. And then all these people start falling over, raising their arms up, and they're all just collapsing everywhere. Like, like the body snatchers or some awful thing. And, but, but then I realised that was the all, um, it was a God thing. <laughs> and it was, it was fine. If she stood up, she was absolutely fine. We had a lovely lunch after. Um, and I think that's how I felt when I first <laughs> was clicking. I was just like, Are this, is this person okay? What's happened? And then someone else started doing it. And I'm going, I don't know what's... Um, but, you know, it's all fine. Everyone was okay in the end. So. See, I, do, I, I don't mind clicking. Because I, I get why. I, I, the, there is a sound argument behind clicking, which is like... Uh, if you're if you right if you're doing slams, funny poems gets laughs and equals better scores. So if you're not doing a funny poem, oh, people can't really react to you know like 
your poem and they don't want to clap because it's too loud, it's too invasive, it breaks the flow. So a click will be is a way of going like, oh, that was a great line without having to shout it out. So I get it for that practical purposes, but I also am not the hugest fan of it. Do, do they um, not do po- not the poetry noises then? Like the oh you mm, 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 oh, oh that I will not tolerate that I go crazy at I remember I'm vividly that. that's I do that <sighs> that's my I do that all the time even when you know I don't even know worst, it I'll just be like oh you know, <laughs> yeah mm, wow <laughs> the worst offender in Scotland <laughs> for that terrible. is Freddie Al- Freddie Alexander is the a hundred percent worst what noises does he make. Oh, there was one time we were, it was, again, it was, um, it was Unislam was being hosted in Edinburgh, the UK Unislam. And um, I was the sacrificial. And so there was maybe 200 odd people in, in TV uh, underground at the Edinburgh Uni. And I come on to do the sacrificial piece. And I did, because I'd just written it. I did the piece about my, my mum passing away. So it's quite a sad poem. Um, and it was, you know, very quiet crowd for it. And I get like three lines in and Freddie, who's sitting two rows back in the audience, just goes, ah, mm, ah, oh, like no. that every couple, of, like a real grunty, mm, yeah, mm. And you're like, oh, Freddie, please don't, please don't. He gets so into it. Yeah, like he's, he's the worst. he's indigestion or making sex Yeah. Oh, like, sure. like a little column A, little column B. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not. My mind are more just like, mm. Uh, um, See that's yeah that's yeah, a sophisticated oh. poetry noise. That's that's yeah, I've been <laughs> that was when I have to talk you, that's what I had when I first went to stanza and did stuff. I right, realized yeah, yeah. it was really interesting because obviously they don't clap. No poems. Which is, is weird. Well if you've kind of kind of you know, come through the spoken word thing, I realise that we we create sets that are based upon these responses, don't we? Like we, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like the poem, you, you feed, like your, your performance sort of builds because of the responses that you get. And there's a sense that you have that if you don't get any response from it, you've messed up, like something. It's not gone well. So yeah. then you find yourself kind of, um, oh, I don't know, like uh, you push in things that you wouldn't normally push in your performance because you're just like, I don't know if these people, <laughs> Try or hear me or they've had some sort of they've all like they've all fallen asleep or so then you over you start finding yourself overdoing it because you're not getting any reaction and then at the end if it was like oh that was amazing you're going oh I didn't I thought you all hated me you could have expressed that during the thing thank yeah. you so it's it was really difficult and then I was I, cause I thought about this for a while going I just it's just I yeah, it was really hard knowing how to put a set together in that kind of atmosphere. Um, yeah. I mean, saying that, the person that went on after me was so great that people could help but clap, which was another <sighs> ego blow. Um, but I did think that, like, it was really interesting about how to perform poems, like that actually, you know, how much is rely- how much do we rely on the response and what does that really say about our work and all, you know, get onto all these big <laughs> questions. Um <laughs> So yeah, I do like poetry noises because if you if you're not going to get anything, <laughs> see it's interesting though because you do because it's it's still one of those you know we're not sure right what's the right etiquette where da 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 like you must find it interesting because you're someone that does sort of you know more theatre esque shows right you're also a playwright and um, so you, you you do these sort of long form theatre shows where I guess you don't want them clapping between. <laughs> bits of poetry right because it'll break the flow and so I, I've seen a lot of spoken word theatre shows or you know sort of long form spoken word shows where you can tell the performer still hasn't figured out how to deal with either cueing the audience to clap or stopping the audience clapping depending on mm. you know what their their preference is do, do you have like a, a means for that or, or have you have you found well, that just, like isn't much of a hurdle I think with um when I wrote the drift, because it's a sort of it, 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 it there's not really. I mean, obviously, I I don't know because I've seen spoken word shows. It's definitely like now I'm reading a poem. Like I've led mm-hmm. up to the narrative, and now there'll be a signal in some way, like a there'll be something that will say this is now the poem, and the title will come up from somewhere. Or, yeah, you know, or a light cue, yeah. or yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't do that in my like with the drift, and the drift is probably. My, the real the, the, my real kind of spoken word show I think stuff that mm-hmm. I've done since then would fall more into the kind of traditional play 
um, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, the drift, the drift had poems in it, but I because they were part of a narrative. And they and the narrative was very poetic. There wasn't really a it didn't I don't think there was a moment where people felt oh now I'm getting a poem. I think it all just felt part of the same thing. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean there was the, I had like different things like I had bits when I knew people were going to get really upset. So that was a different kind of reaction to play with and to to be aware of. Um, and I suppose that's what I suppose every performer, and if you you know if you're if you are a performer or you write work for performance, then you're always factoring in the response and how you play with mm-hmm. that and how you and how you push that or how you pull away from it or how you um, lead someone to somewhere and then twist it or unex- you know make it unexpected. You know, that's kind of that's what you do if you're creating live performance you should be aware that there's a live audience there. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. It sounds like such a simple thing, but it's amazing how many people don't kind of factor that in to, to like, I see people time out a set, right? I've, I've seen a million people do it and they're like, cool, that poem's three minutes and that poem's two minutes. So that'll be my five minute set. And I'm like, well, hold on. Is no one going to clap? Are you not going to, say any other words are you not going to take a breath between your two poems because that's like you have a five minute set and so you filled every second of it with poem then mm. it's you know what i mean and that's a really difficult thing because you must know as a poet if you get 10 minutes the instinct is that well i don't know actually if there's an instinct but i know that some poets they want to fill that 10 minutes with as much of their poem as poems as they can which is, yeah, no, yeah. Like, like, I, my thing is if someone gives me a 10 minute set, then that means I have seven minutes worth yes, of poems. Yes, me too. Less than and I have, go. Yeah, and I have, a, you know, a little bit of time for between those poems, for claps, for me to have a, you know, a sip of my beer or whatever, and for chit chat, and for me to do intro, outro, da da da, you know, like whatever, you know, another three, four minutes for that. So like if I get given a 10 minute set, I'll normally do like two reasonable length poems and a short poem. And also, you know, as an organizer, like I've organized events, we love the people that go under. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're like, great. It is you people that save the show when someone else goes massively over. <laughs> so people also, do that all the time when I book them. They go, is it all right? I'm only going to do three. I don't know if that'll use my whole time. And I'm like, dude, do three. Go do yeah. two. I don't care. <laughs> it's the biggest thing, because I, I think what I've learned, if I've got, if anyone asks me what's your, well, actually, if people ask me, give them their tips on performance i'll be here all day but if i was <laughs> like you know you go like oh and actually this is a good idea but um i'll get my but list one, yeah, <laughs> but one of the things i always think is actually what i have learned is not is to do less is to like create a set like you would almost yeah like almost like it's a, a mini like a bit, what am i talking about like it's a whole performance so they have to the poem, there's some sort of story or some sort of flow or some revelation, whether that's about you or whether that's about something that you want to talk about within that set, and you and you leave it, leave them wanting. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, I also do this thing where I always tell people how many poems I'm going to read, but that's only because I have a really short attention span and I quite like sitting. <laughs> I like I am this person, the audience member that goes. Oh, good, there's only one more to go, and then it's break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if someone gets up and I'm like, I don't know how many poems they're going to go if this will ever end, I just start getting really, like, itchy. <laughs> like, I need to leave, I need to leave. Um, but there is there is a threshold, and even people I'm really enjoying listening to, like, especially if you're on a bill, say, where you're you're you've got equal time with other people, right? There's an innate timer in folk they can tell when you are taking the piss and have gone way over your time. You yeah. know, the, the last person came on and did two two-minute poems. The next, the person before that did two two-minute poems. The person before that did two two-minute poems. You're on your fourth poem. Yeah. Like, people know what that means. <laughs> they can, yeah, because so, they also start, do you do that thing? I don't know whether that's because I've organized events, but when someone does that, I start looking at the host oh, yeah, to see if they're getting fidgety. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <'Cause> yep. <laughs> How annoyed are they at this point? Oh, no, the crap. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, things like to remember, especially if you're doing a gig where everyone's got a beer, that oh, if yeah, you're yeah, before yeah. the break, factor in that half the audience all need a wee. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Or they finish their drink 
and they're not going to enjoy they're not going to be nice to you or appreciate you if you keep them too long from that yeah because however interesting you think you are <laughs> you're not as interesting or as you're not as neat they don't need you as much as they need the toilet a mm-hmm. cigarette or a pint that's how it feels. So true, so true. Yeah. It's interesting though because we're talking there, right? So the, the drift obviously is uh, it's a very important piece. You've been working on for a while. You did you did the the stage show of it, and um, it's you've it's been very well praised, very like good reception to it. I know you had bigger plans to tour before all the chaos kicked in and stuff. Oh, no, and I, I know did you were the saying, tour. I did do the tour. Oh, did you do? I, I yeah, thought yeah, I thought no. it got caught a little short because no, of no, the. No, I did. I did mature. Oh, did you? That oh, brilliant, happens. brilliant, brilliant. That all finished before. Yeah, it was, it was those heady days of 2019. <laughs> it's all, it's all a blur. I went to see when we were the, for the gym thing. I was about to go, and that was gym back in January 2019. That was January 2020. It just seems like it was January 2019. <laughs> so how did the tour oh, go? It was, um, it was no oh god, it was amazing. Yeah, it was really amazing. It was it. it I mean, it was all it, it was such an interesting process. The drift because none of it. I never really had a massive plan with it in the sense that I did it in a wee room in the fringe and it just kept, people kept wanting to support it. So it just kept going on this journey and then it ended up kind of being offered this kind of proper production and a, and a tour with all the kind of stuff that goes with that. And it was, it was, it was kind of, yeah, it was, it was, it was really great. It had really lovely audiences and lovely reviews and everything you could dream of. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that, that yeah, it was positive responses and stuff because it's, it's rubbish. I mean, I, again, I know we, I've spoken about it on the live cast before and I always, I always feel bad sitting there chatting about it in my position as a straight white dude, you know, like, but y- you do see so much of that, like, especially in the poetry scene, right? People are bearing these very, like, real situations and whether it's, you know, when it's on topics about being a woman or being, a, you know, a person of colour or, like, whatever it is, you you're you just get this immediate backlash or horror. And I see it on friends of mine's, you know, posts and poems and things like that. And it just... It, I can't imagine what it's like to deal with that sort of nonsense. I mean, I, mean, I was lucky because I didn't, I didn't get backlash. But well, actually, the good, fear yeah. of getting one was pretty horrendous to hold. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. I didn't. I mean, I was. I, it, it was amazing that I didn't. Like, it was so warm. Um, Even with the because because the one I was really it, you know sort of thought that it might come that way on was the the video for uh, Scotland. You're you're no mine, yeah, which is. No. It, it, for those that don't know, if you're watching, it's an amazing poem, um, but it's a very like intense poem where you you let out a lot of that like clearly you know anger you felt about about the you know the way people are seen and the way people are treated and and things like that and being like no I'm not just gonna sit there and be like this is cool and people can take that the wrong way right a line like because it ends with Scotland and they're like fuck you is the sort of last line it's interesting because it doesn't end it ends with Scotland fuck you but it doesn't end with a Scotland fuck you. It's more yeah, like Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Because I think that poem, and like, and, and very much what the play is, it's not, it's Scotland talking to itself. I think what the play is saying is, this was a, this is a, that Scotland poem is a love poem. It's about, yeah. I am here, my history is here, my Jamaican, my colonial history is part of your history. I exist, I am part of you. And it's a pain around being written out of Scotland's story and being told you don't belong. It's about transatlantic slavery. It's about yeah. colonialism. It, it, and it's, it's right there in that first line, a, right? Sepia tone. Yeah. Like it's a, yeah. But it's a love poem. And I think that that, for me, maybe that isn't what is why I've not had the backlash in a way, yeah. or people have received that poem positively, is because it's not, it's a, it isn't, um, there, there is, there is a, there is a longing and a love there, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. um, and I think as well with, in the con, because I was worried about that when they filmed it because, in the context of the of the piece, that poem could also be read as about being a love poem to my absent father too. So it it, it mm-hmm. has a sort of within the context of the play, it's saying a lots of different things. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So when you pull something out and you put it on a, on its own like that, there is you do worry that. 
that won't come across but it did it, I said I, I kind of I've, I've been lucky that um, the trolls haven't got it um <laughs> Because that's the thing, right? Like you, you can sit there, and you know anyone that any reasonable person that watches that gets what you're trying to say, right? They get you're not like it would be such a weird thing for the national theater to release if it was you genuinely being like "fuck off." Um, so it's like I, I find it really fascinating that I, I'm glad people haven't, but you you see it so often. You know, people latch on to you know a quote with none of the the tone or thought behind it none of the craft behind it and go look at what they're saying or what they're doing i mean because it happened recently with like gray crosby and their poem about getting a haircut and you know which is quite like a funny but they're not even making like a grand political it's small p politics hannah is what it is Mm. and and they they (laughs) they go you know they got so much hassle for it and stuff and you're like what listen to the context around the the subject matter yeah i'm glad it didn't translate that well, way for i mean yourself. yeah i think i mean, i think i was probably lucky that it was kind of released you know not, not i don't know yeah i was lucky and and i think um also just the the furor around trans rights is a lot more keep board heavy in that way that's not true because yeah. race and stuff is just as as vicious um but maybe within the arts um i think that there's there's not a lot of racists logging on to national theater scotland's youtube <laughs> yeah um yeah. whereas there that that sort of anti-trans and also thing does still exist social more as well that. so it's a different forum isn't it you know i i, I was thinking i wrote recently about kind of put you know that that thing of choosing where you put your work or feeling needing sort of protected spaces to share your work and I think um you get you can choose that sometimes you know like sometimes there you can make choices about where you share stuff not yeah. that there's no that that's that's not coming out right because that's like saying that you <laughs> you deserve it if you don't but I'm just saying that sometimes <sighs> you know you when I was put on the drift and it was about grief and it was about my dad and there was a lot of vulnerability around that it was I I had to really assert my control about who was supporting me around that about the the, the, you know I put a lot of support networks and Mm -hmm. I was careful about um the advertising around it and I was I was you know so there was I I did my best to make the the space in which that was shared as safe as possible for me so that I could be at my kind of most creative best, I suppose. Um, I I totally get what you're saying about that as well. I I get as well, you don't want it to sound like you're going, because it is that double-edged thing. Everyone should have a right to not be attacked. Yeah, Yeah. the issue is that 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 exists. And so like, sadly, people have to sometimes make those choices to go like, okay, is that work you want to put out there knowing the possibility for those types of backlash and those types of you know just abuse which is is it, like that shouldn't be the case but you know sometimes the best advice is to kind of go like well that's you know people are going to find you know if you're going to release stuff publicly it's it's going to have that element to it which is a pity but, but that's i think that's yeah i don't know because i think as well it's that idea about <sighs> that it shouldn't be that if you release something that you um that you deserve what you get in that way. You know what I no, mean? It's like, no, no, no. The, I think, I think people, we should, I mean, I, when I put my thing out on YouTube, I said, I think I said I wanted the comment switched off. Um, yeah. And yeah. I didn't look at it. I stayed away from it. Um, and I wanted people to protect me from that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what my point is really. I suppose it's just like, it's, it's, I would hate for, artists to feel that the, or that, that we only allow what's the word I'm trying to say that the only people that can produce art are people who have got some sort of you know incredible resilience and because I feel like we'd miss a load of voices if yeah, they yeah. only if they if they were expected to um, be exposed you know that there was an expectation that they had to um, engage 
that world you know like i think yeah yeah you, like you absolutely shouldn't have to and i think i think that's the important thing is like and as artists you know new platforms and stuff we learn coping mechanisms like anything else mm-hmm. and you go like i would always say to people you know if you're putting out something especially that you feel you know has a chance to get that kind of feedback or, or, or aggression or whatever don't not put it out still put it out yeah. but let let a pal of yours deal with your youtube comments or just turn them off or you know whatever it is like i remember years and years ago agnes torek did a, a poem and she got a lot of hate on a, online and i sat one day and just deleted all the negative like not negative comment. like you can make a negative comment there's a difference between a negative comment and a hateful you know bigoted comment and stuff and so you know, I was just getting rid of anything that was like that so she could still see the positive feedback and you know people being like this is a great video or whatever so it was like you can you know you can find a way to I think I think as well it's like I, I, um, it's like almost now we look at Twitter for applause you know what I mean it's yeah, like yeah. it's just I don't think it's where you should look I think that you need to <laughs> just not it's but also, what was I going to say when you were saying that? I had a thought. It was a good one. It's gone. But it, but I think it, I think it's really important to put controversial stuff out there. I think it's really important yeah, to challenge yeah. the society we're in. But I also don't think people who want to engage with that, who want to, who feel, they don't have a right because you've asked a question on Twitter or you've commented. They don't have a right for as, as a response. It's that thing that when the art is the yeah. response, the, the art is what's out there. That is all the, the artist's duty. They don't have to do the follow up. <laughs> like they don't have to. I feel like it, there's so much pressure on the on people who produce work like that to carry on talking about it once they've already like not realizing that the work was what they wanted to say. Yeah, it wasn't the beginning of a conversation. It was that's the that's the thing. I'm all, that was it. You know, that's I'm all for like death of the artist. I'm or death of the art, author. I'm like once the thing's done. Don't That's come and talk to, to me say. about the thing. It's like, it's no longer mine. You can discuss the thing. Great. You can disagree with it. You can think it's it's the best or the worst. You can come up with a million different points and engage with a million different people about it. But I don't care once I've done it. I've got that out of my system now. I made the bit of art. And if your like, your means yeah. of expression is Twitter, you go to town. But don't at me, mate, because I'm, yeah. I'm a poet, not a Twitter but, person. But, also, but it's also like if for a lot of, you know, I went into poetry as you could probably tell from my <laughs> humming and harring I went into poetry and I went into writing because I wanted to have control about what I said where I said it I wanted to think about each line each word I want to mm-hmm. be sure of it all and then like when I was doing the drift I did this um a really fun like um <clears throat> after show chat about the drift and I sort of said a lot of the stuff in the after show chat which I'd said in the drift but not as well, not as eloquently, not as yeah, because you're you're and I just thought free after, balling it, right? Like, yeah, I was just and I was just really what I think it had a very quick gin in between the finishing of the show, and so I was not in the, and I remember just afterwards going, oh, I, like why did I do that? Because I gave a perfect <laughs> hour of three years of work <laughs> on what I wanted to say about all of these issues, and I undid it all in twenty minutes of just inane rambling and pulling out ideas from the air and I went no this is why we write crafted shows oh it all makes sense now I didn't want to do the after show like that was not what I was going to be good at like I had the thing that I could say and but there's such a pressure now for us to sort of discuss our work like in that sort of detail like discuss the issues we brought up in our work which is fine but it's also yeah. like the, I just did this really well in the thing. I think it's that's that especially wrote. hard. Yeah, it's especially hard when you know, like you said, something like the drift is so rooted in not only you know things that affect you personally, but affect a lot of people personally. Yeah. You know, issues around you know race and acceptance and things like that. But but also a, a very specific and particular point of, of grief and loss, like. Once you that that like you said, you've gone through a huge process of writing and editing and rehearsing to put that together, and then you pour you know emotion and effort into portraying that effectively on stage. Maybe after it, you don't necessarily want to have a big chat about those subject matters. You know, what I mean, it's draining. Are like, not, are you just not capable of doing it well? I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, I mean, it's really interesting about the drift as well, because obviously, it's that thing about we things get. If you write, I wrote a play really about grief. Mm-hmm. And part of my grieving 
was looking at who my dad was. My dad happened to be a black Scottish man, so that led me to be talking about the effect of racism on his life and how that damaged him and the effect it had on him. But really, the play was about grief. And everybody that came along to see it got that. And so a lot Mm -hmm. of my conversations, like the natural conversations you have with audience members when you're in the bar or, you know, were about, I lost my dad, that made me think about that, or I lost this person, or I lost, or I, God, you know, that really made, that was just all the, you know, that those are the conversations. And, and the play was also about belonging. So people understand belonging. But of course it gets packaged that you're writing this play about race because yeah, you're writing yeah. about your life. So it becomes, and there were moments, there were obviously moments in the play where I am directly talking about racism in Scotland, but I'm always talking about it in the context of the damage it did to my father the life that the way I don't get to live the full life that I want it was all very personal it was all about yeah. grieving it was all about letting go um and so it's interesting isn't it that you then yeah anyway it doesn't matter it's a longer thing but um but yeah that was what yeah that it, it was that thing about you've you've spent so long crafting something to then try and talk it was like one like somebody once said to me could you write a wee pit like a wee paragraph to just tell me what the drift's about so like it was for the you know could you just write could you just condense yeah. it into a paragraph and i was like if i could condense nope. it into a paragraph i wouldn't ri- written like, that would be the poem but if i could do like, it into a paragraph i'm a poet like i am a poet so if there was a way as a poet i could write that in a page i would have done it because that's what my <laughs> saved yourself a lot of time and hassle that's what i would do like it might not have been as it. it might not have been as as good a tour though, Hannah. If the whole show had just been. like one poem, I would have probably yeah. done better with my flu though. To be honest, <laughs> like, there you go. Now I can go back to bed. Um, yeah, <coughs> that's crazy. I was, lots, I was, but nothing really there. But yeah, I was going to be yeah. all over the place. No, it's it's fascinating stuff because, like, like I said as well, because I brought up to you before we started recording that, like, I, I haven't read your article yet because when we're recording, it's it's kind of just come out. But um, I'm very keen to read it because it, it, it it's seems to be talking about a lot of stuff that like I find very interesting which is about you know like expectations on poets to do certain types of material or 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 to voice you know concern about certain things that that people are attributing to them right and it's like you said there it's easy to look at your play which is about you know your life and a thing you went through and go oh it's about race and it's going well part of your life I'm sure as you know a person that's grown up in a predominantly white nation you know like that would have an impact on you race probably plays a bigger part in your life than my life right but it's not your whole life (laughs) and so it's it's try to see that in folk like i know i spoke to at length uh to pj about it where we were like chatting about how people expect him to have the black poem or whatever or you know tyrone lewis always says like people don't expect him to have his geek poem or whatever it is and like yeah i just i find it very fascinating that that aspect of because no one expects me to do anything, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like, at most, because I'm a white guy, I'm expected to do some love poems. But, like, outside think, of that... Yeah, I mean, I think part of what my essay was saying as well is that um, it was about, kind of, the spaces we need to to become an artist, I suppose. I think that was what, what the essay was... I mean, it was. It was a sort of lot of things, but I, I think, for me, I think it was just feeling about, like... Yeah, I know there was lots of moments in there and the essay was like talking about being a writer of colour and about how there's an expectation that... Oh, no, yeah, there's an expectation that you're not talented, but you're a tick box, that you are... that you're only where you are because somebody else... somebody else's good deed, you know, because someone felt was such a good person. <laughs> that wanted, or, you know, and then also that there's an awareness that there's very little opportunities. Like, you're, like your career will be as well you know that you need to I don't know what yeah so I think there was a lot about just how precarious it feels to be a writer of colour in Scotland like and 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 how hard it is to feel that there is a career in front of you that there's a natural progression that it isn't just like a you get this moment you know and 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 the kind of the the pressure the kind yeah and all the the how yeah I think it was about that and I think it was about kind of my journey to being a writer and 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 as I said this is like what I was saying earlier it's like I've said it all in the essay and I feel like now to try and talk about (laughs) it it's like not as good as the way I did it 
I can so solve the issue. I'll put a little. Like I yeah. um, I'll put a little link in the description below. Uh, people should go out and I'll just ruin check it out. for you in the next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, Bella Caledonia has Hannah in it. Uh, that 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 article, but I know uh, good friends of I Am Loud in the show, Iona Lee and Jim Monahan are doing some excellent work at uh, Bella Caledonia. Yeah. So go and check them out. Check that out. Uh, very excited to see what they've been producing recently. Um, but yeah, before before we kind of we're gonna get um we're gonna stick about for a little chat on the livecast, Hannah, uh, for those patrons that that support us. But I did want to check just before we kind of wrap up, uh, if you would be up for reading us a little poem. I will do. Um, I'm gonna read you a poem from this fantastic book I'm in, which is the Nairiki's um Untitled Three anthology, and it's got some great poets in it. But I'm gonna read you a poem that I wrote called I actually wrote this I think after in like the mists of Donald Trump getting elected so um, <laughs> and it still feels very relevant and it's called post truth I want to lie in wait for you kick you in the shins trap you in a basement feed you your eyeballs through the gap in the door I want you to howl until you're hoarse, resurrect your demons, kill your angels, hack your Tinder profile. I want to drink cheap Prosecco from the skulls of your children, piss on your perspective, let it mix, brew a craft beer, distill a boutique gin. I want to laugh at you in your underwear, lose you in a maze, chase you with a shotgun, bring on the zombie apocalypse. Ride the four horsemen through your living room, feed them your pets. I want to bring you cups of tar with seagull wings. Tell you it's your morning coffee. Feed you your neighbour's food waste. Take you out and shoot you. Burn your libraries, shred your history, pull you from your grave, make you dance for me. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's very intense, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. It's one of the things I, I didn't get a chance to say because we didn't, didn't get to it, but your, your poem, um, Scotland, You're No Mine, one of the things I love so much about it, and I know you're saying it's, like, it's a love poem and stuff, but that there's a lot of the language to it there and stuff that is, you know, like you're calling out the issue. It's, it's, it's not a, a polite response to, you know, because that's what people want, right? People who are disenfranchised, we want them to ask nicely and be calm about it, despite hundreds and years of being calm and stuff. And I don't know, it felt to me that poem was was like, a, if you're not going to be nice about it, neither am I. Mm. And this is a similar thing to there of like that that sort of just the horrific imagery, but it's a reflection back. It's not coming from that, you know, your side. That's like how that is well, it's spoken kind of, and behaved. I really enjoyed, it's, yeah, I wrote that poem... I think it was a workshop that um I think it was a Caroline Bird workshop actually that poem comes oh, from nice. where she just asked us to become something and mm. I decided I was going to become post truth and decide what it would say to me and that is what I think post truth would say um, That's so good. That's its intention. <laughs> so, yeah. kind of, uh, so it was kind of it was kind of good just to think yeah, that this is this it wants to destroy us. That's what this thing is. I know, I've always thought of you as quite mild mannered, Hannah. But now with those two poems, plus we've got your poem "Rage" up on our YouTube, I'm starting to see a picture here of uh, <laughs> something beneath the surface. Well, you know, I'm I'm, I'm one of those Edinburgh crowd, so um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I I have fire there, but it's just um. It's, uh, kept it's kept it's kept burning <laughs> just so oh, yeah. sim- I'm, I'm a slow simmerer i think that's what i am that's that would be the edinburgh in me it's, just, it's very that's a very scottish way to be i think yeah, yeah just, uh, just <laughs> lots of tutting that's that's my <laughs> these are just yeah this is just my tut poems i think that, um yeah wonderful that's... i'm into it um, Anna, where can people <laughs> find all your work and follow what you're up to where where should they go um well i have a website and i have nice. a twitter thing and um, and also you can get my book Finding Sea Glass, which is the poems from the drift, on the Stude Rhubarb website and mm-hmm. um, bookshops as well. Um, and 
that's all. Yeah, that's find me that way. Web- website put, is um, yeah. Hannah dot com or something. No, it's not that. Can you put a link up, Kevin? I will be putting <laughs> links in the description. What a great cue for me, Hannah. Lovely done. Uh, I will be putting I will put some links to where you can get uh, Hannah's website and Twitter, and I'll definitely be putting up a link to Stude Rhubarb. We love those guys. They do some incredible we publishing do. work. They've they've got some great names on their bill um, and continue to do it. You know, they they just put out that um, was it the oh, I can never remember the name of the thing. I go, it's an amazing thing. It's called the the Fellowship of the. Oh yeah, yeah, their their thing, their fellowship of the rhubarb or something. So yeah, we're know. going with that. I feel like I've let but them was, down terribly now. <laughs> it's a really nice project. This, like, uh, I'm pretty sure it's uh, Colin Bramwell, Chris Boyland. Uh, who else got? Was it BB June and um, yeah. someone else? Four Car- four really good poets got sort of commissioned to do. Oh, was it Carly? I think it was Carly, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. I think it was Carly Brown, which is a great foursome of folks. So yeah, Stude Rhubarb are doing like spec books, really good stuff to support uh, the kind of Scottish spoken word scene, Scottish literary scene. So that's very cool. Yeah, all the links and descriptions will be there uh, for where you can find more of Hannah's work. And I suggest you do. I suggest you go and check her out because uh, she is, yeah, an insane performer, insane writer, and a wonderful person. Hannah, thank you so much for coming to chat to me on the Loudcast. I appreciate it. It's been lovely You're hearing welcome. you. Thanks. <laughs> No worries. Um, and we're going to, like I said, we're going to stick about for a chat on the Loudcast Extra. So if you're interested in that, jump on over to the Patreon page. But for now, that is all from me and Hannah. Until next time, we will see you later. Hannah, say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.